Hello, this is Charles Herring, Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder at WITFU. We're going to give you a demonstration now of some of the capabilities of the WITFU Precinct 6.1 interface. So you can ship data into WITFU Precinct uh, via Syslog, NetFlow, uh, Kafka, uh, pulling from a Kafka broker, uh, Kafka Topics, or, um, or shipping via agent data such as uh, Beats agents. But uh, new to 6.1, we also have the ability to set up custom APIs. Now, creating APIs are part of the licensing agreement with WITFU, so if you need one of these set up, I recommend uh, reaching out to the WITFU team. But we do support the open API specification, or the Swagger specification, uh, used to be called. Uh, and you can just import an open API spec, which is a JSON object. So there's a 3.08 uh, object for Firepower uh, Threat Defense API. You import that, and we can see all of the operations that we can run against the data. Um, you can also build these from scratch just using the graphical builder here. But again, please reach out to WITFU support if you need it. Um, jobs are a couple, couple of different types. So one is about collecting information. So if we wanted to collect information from Azure, we can look at the states machine uh, that pulls the information in, grab the alerts, get the audits, generate the artifacts. And these can be built using the graphical interface here or importing um, using the Amazon states language. Um, so really easy way to build um, logical uh, response playbooks, whether they're to collect information or respond information. So um, here I have a trigger that's, when you look at the info of it, it's a respond action and I'm going to pass into it a host object. I could also choose a user file or, or whatever I wanted to do. And the idea here is to create a state machine that uh, can do work for us, look things up, and make it easier for incident responders when it comes time to execute a job. So again, we also help in building these uh, for our customers. So if you need them, let us know. So with data coming into the system, we can analyze uh, different artifacts. So let's pick on just an empty query I just ran. Um, an artifact is a normalized uh, record of information with fields extracted in it. And if you want to see the entire format of an artifact, you can see here, these are the fields we extracted from this message. And the null are, uh, represent, uh, um, represent information that if it was present in the message or available to us, we would have filled it in. So these can be, this JSON can be downloaded if needed. Uh, or an entire CSV of the information can be downloaded here. Um, you can filter the result sets uh, here. So start just toggling in here. If you just wanted to look at carbon black, you could start typing in carbon black and the other stuff would filter out. Uh, or if you just wanted to look at all the stuff from John Doe, you can also filter that out. So the idea here is just make it very easy uh, to interact with the data. We can also do some uh, simple uh, uh, distribution graphs, so which, which IP addresses are most commonly the clients, uh, different uh, bytes and so forth. A really important part is just relationalizing the data. So this is a algorithm for concentric layout. We can also look at it uh, in, in CoS layout. We can zoom into these things to see the different relationship clusters that are created from uh, the search information. And we also enhance the data. Uh, WIDFU Precinct comes with a, uh, a feed that includes a geo resolution so we can see how these things lay out onto the map. Um, you can save searches uh, and then come back and run them again at a later time. This is particularly useful uh, in other um, uh, for re recurring searches. Building a search is really straightforward. So I can say, if I just want to see the stuff from John, from uh, Jay Stark, I can say where the username, or you could say IP address, or we just start typing whatever field you want from the, uh, from the artifact schema. They'll start auto-completing. You can say, yeah, where it equals, and I'll click up here, and we, uh, then start typing all the available uh, data in that field becomes available, and we can just kick off a search and then it'll scan the entire big data stack, whether you know that's 100 megs or 100 petabytes worth of data and come back with the results and then uh, keep them uh, cached here for you for, for later uh, review. Um, once we've taken in the artifacts and made it simple to search, and uh, so if you need to get to your data, you can, and providing visualization of that data, we, the next thing we do is we analyze it all. We wanna look at every single artifact and figure out if they're telling us 
that a potential attack is occurring. So going down the left-hand bar here is a list of all of our incidents. Um, I've here picked Hyperlark, which is an auto-generated name. The status is open, which means I should be working on it. It hasn't been closed. The modus operandi here is data theft. The next one here is ransomware. The suspicion is 0.956, which is very high. The score ranges from zero, meaning absolute certainty it's benign. One, as it gets closer to one, your certainty that it's real increases. It has five uh, attacking hosts, four targeted hosts, one set of credentials, and two pieces of malware um, inside of this, no emails. Um, you can filter that list by picking whether you want to look at the different behaviors we're looking at, different statuses, and so forth. Um, you can do a full keyword search looking for information inside of a specific incident. So um, here we are looking at one of my favorite incidents. The progression here represents, because we're looking at data theft, this is the progression of a successful data theft. Uh, what we're looking at is this machine was infected by this piece of malware. It uh, subsequently opened up a command and control uh, uh, connection to this host. It scanned these three hosts and this host. It used these credentials from JDO, uh, and those same credentials were, were used in the same, same uh, behaviors on all uh, one, two, three, four, five of these hosts. Um, this machine then suck data up here because of this SSH connection, data was staged into the DMZ, and then sent out of the network. Um, looking at the incident at the incident level, um, we have a summary of the information here at the bottom, a breakdown of the connections uh, by time, uh, and the, uh, the different alerts. So there was 25 different alerts from different tools that came in that helped us stitch this information together. Uh, the colors represent the uh, different behaviors that are observed in, uh, in the in modus operandi here for data theft. Um, you can interact with the different uh, components. So if I click uh, on where the data went in the end, um, I can see that it's geographically located in China. And we observe a number of things here that it has multiple bad behaviors. It's both Ex, uh, exploiting and exfiltrating. Um, it has, it was detected by two or more detection sources, so it was reported by Carbon Black and Cisco Stealth Watch. Um, it has multiple graph relationships. It has a bad relationship here with this guy and a bad relationship with uh, this credential. Um, the severity code was low, which the RFC tells us is uh, important, and then more then a gig of traffic was transferred. Matter of fact, six terabytes was transferred over this uh, web socket. So all of those things drove its suspicion up to 0.96. Um, we can also use those response jobs we looked at to, to start automating the cleanup in these scenarios. So we can say, let's block the host. I didn't configure this correctly, so please forgive the poor demo here. Uh, but it started it and then didn't work because I don't have anything set up to finish that. But it logs it. It logs that I started it. So we have a permanent audit trail that the block started and whether or not the block succeeded or failed. And we get the detailed information above. Um, once the investigation is over, we just mark it as this case convicted, meaning someone tried to steal our data and they succeeded. And so that's Hyperlark um, updated there. Uh, unique to Witfu Precinct is the ability to create metrics that allow you to, to proactively keep things healthy. And so the first thing we do is inventory all of the messages that we receive uh, in the context of whether or not uh, they're providing critical security control coverage. So uh, CSC1 also maps to you know, ISO and NIST frameworks. Um, and we look and we see we have some carbon black, some CrowdStrike, and some Qualys logs that are covering about 60% of what needs to be covered for CSC1. We also have some places where we have no tool coverage, and so we're missing, uh, missing those. So in a healthy organization, you're going to have critical security control coverage of 100%. Uh, we're also monitoring vulnerability patch management. Are you scanning and patching all of the machines that should be scanned and patched? Once you have the right tools in place, we want to make sure they're configured correctly. So we can, uh, uh, in the case of StealthWatch here, in this uh, fake data, it's showing a $44,000 per month 
uh, labor cost that has to be expended to handle the false positives being generated. Uh, the blue represents money that would be saved if the things that were being detected by Stealth Watch were somehow being enforced. So uh, the behaviors being caught here were automatically being stopped by the infrastructure. And green represents the things that Stealth Watch are detecting that are automatically being uh, blocked. So in the case of the ASA firewall, this organization saving almost $24,000 per month in uh, labor cost by uh, blocking incidents before they require intervention. This funnel really represents the health of the system. How many alarms came in? How many of them? Uh, how many incidents were created from those alarms? How many of them were not blocked? Um, so, and then how many of those that were not blocked have a suspicion score above 0.5? And so, this these two numbers should be very close to zero in a healthy uh, in a healthy uh, security practice. And by keeping them at zero, you don't have to respond to problems. You're able. Uh, just to focus on uh, preventing them from happening in the first place. We also provide metrics on tool gap overlap. So uh, what tools are blocking what, and uh, if we have some circle that's eaten by other circles where we have complete overlap, it's, a, uh, it's an argument for removing uh, that system from the network. After we've looked at having the right tools in place and we looked at how many incidents are going unblocked, we're able to uh, very quickly and accurately calculate how, many, how much labor needs to be expended. So in this particular uh, organization, because so many things are going unblocked and so many incidents are being created from false positives, we need to spend 2,700 uh, 2, uh, labor hours per month to address it, which means we need to staff almost 16 people uh, we would need to staff 16 people to do all of that work. So you can choose to staff 16 people, or you can choose to go back and proactively fix the security architecture so the fires don't uh, start in the first place. Um, all of those metrics boil up to the width through readiness score. The width through readiness score is a score from 0 to 5, where the first two points are for complete coverage of uh, the critical security controls, up to one more point for properly detecting and uh, responding to vulnerabilities, the next point is for the security architecture accurately detecting and blocking uh, attacks. And the last point is for the human beings um, completing the work that they're supposed to complete. So in this way, most of our customers spend their time making sure they have the right tools deployed in the right places, that those tools are configured correctly, so that the, uh, the net impact is a very low requisite uh, FTE headcount. So I hope this has been helpful. Uh, this has been uh, Charles Herring, Chief Technology Officer and Co-Founder at Whitfoo.